In a judgment hailed as progressive and groundbreaking, the Supreme Court yesterday ruled that all women, whether married or not, are entitled to seek an abortion in the 22 to 24 weeks gestation period. The court was hearing the case of an unmarried woman whose plea to terminate her pregnancy in this period was earlier rejected by the Delhi High Court. Under Rule 3B of the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Rules 2003 amended in 2021, for abortion between 20 to 24 weeks, there are seven different categories of women who could access abortion within this gestation period, including women with change of marital status during an ongoing pregnancy, like widowhood or divorce. The Delhi High Court had held that this did not extend to unmarried women in consensual relationships. Of course, the Supreme Court has not agreed with the Delhi High Court. Activists have hailed the Supreme Court's decision as one that provides a ray of hope. The Pratigya campaign, a collective that works to improve women's access to safe abortion healthcare services, said this ruling interprets the provisions of the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act in a progressive manner and questions the unreasonable classification made by this law. This interpretation is the law of the land and will ensure that single women seeking abortion beyond 20 weeks cannot be refused on the grounds of the narrowness of the law. Well, there is a lot to unpack from that Supreme Court judgment. It will require an understanding of what exactly the law of the land is and how it works in practice on the ground. Gauri Pillai is an expert in reproductive rights and justice. She researches, writes and teaches on comparative constitutional law, discrimination law, human rights law, and reproductive rights and justice. Thank you, Dr. Pillai, for agreeing to speak to us here at Scroll. Thank you for having me, Smeta, for this really important conversation. Yes. Um, right away, uh, before we speak about the import of the Supreme Court judgment, uh, can you help us understand, uh, if I may, the story so far? When did the medical practice procedure of abortion start being regulated in India? And as of today, who is allowed to access the procedure for medical termination of her pregnancy and broadly under what circumstances? Um, thank you for that question. And I think that's a great place to start, actually. So what is important to recognize is that the medical termination of pregnancy in India, the legal regulation of it, began with criminalization back in the 1860s. So under the Indian Penal Code, it is still criminal to voluntarily cause a woman to miscarry, except where in good faith it is to save the life of the pregnant woman. So as you can see, the only case where the IPC allows termination of pregnancy is when the life of the woman is under threat. So if there is no termination, she would die, literally. And, um, and this provision criminalizes not just the doctor providing the abortion, but also the woman seeking the abortion. And so after this provision was introduced, there was a huge realization that simply criminalizing abortion did not mean that the need for abortions was reduced. And in fact, it simply compelled women to approach unsafe abortion with backstreet abortion providers. And this led to huge rates of maternal mortality and morbidity amongst women. And in fact, even today, as the Supreme Court judgment notes, abortion, unsafe abortion is the third largest cause for maternal mortality in India. So in 1971, to redress this problem of maternal mortality caused by unsafe abortions, there was a proposal to introduce the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act or the MTPA. So there are three things to recognize about the MTPA. The first is that it allows abortions only under specific conditions throughout the period of gestational period of pregnancy. Second is that these conditions become more stringent or more serious as the gestational period progresses or as the pregnancy progresses. And the third is that doctors are responsible for determining whether these conditions have been satisfied or not. The decision does not rest with the, the pregnant woman in question. So to talk, you asked me what the conditions are where you can access an abortion. So under the 1971 Act, um, you can a woman can access an abortion up to 12 weeks with the consent of one medical professional and from 12 to 20 weeks with the consent of two medical professionals. If in either case, the medical professionals are in good faith satisfied that the continuation of the pregnancy would cause either a grave injury to the physical or mental health of the pregnant woman, or if there is a substantial risk 
that the fetus which is born after the pregnancy would be so severely handicapped. So, um, and then we have two explanations which tell us what grave injury to physical and mental health mean. So it includes cases of where there's an allegation of rape. It is the law presumes that there is a grave injury to mental and physical health from continuation of the pregnancy. And in 1971, the law said that if the pregnancy was caused due to a failure of contraception between a married woman and her husband, then once again, there is a presumption that there is a grave injury to mental and physical health. And one more important clause to mention is that in assessing grave injury to health, the law requires the doctors and the courts to take into account a woman's reasonable or foreseeable environment. Um, now, we had an amendment to the MTPA in, in 2021, uh, which changed a few things, did not change many things. So what it did not change was a requirement that um, abortion is allowed only when conditions are satisfied. That still remains in the law. And the only condition to have changed at all is that now uh, the failure of contraception presumption that I mentioned earlier applies not just to married women and their husbands, but also to any woman and her partner. And this, of course, was an important factor in the Supreme Court's decision in this specific case we're discussing today. Um, the other thing that did not change is that the 2021 amendment did not take away the role of the medical professionals. They are still very much part of the law as sort of gatekeepers to when women can access abortions. What it did change, though, is that now there is no 12 week and then 20 week categorization. Instead, from zero to 20 weeks, you need the consent of one medical professional. And from 20 to 24 weeks, um, with the consent of two medical professionals, abortions are allowed for certain vulnerable categories of women. And as and who those vulnerable categories of women are was notified in October 2021. And as you rightly mentioned, it extends to seven categories, one of which is in contestation here. And the last thing to make mention is that now there is no gestation limit for fetuses with um, abnormalities, with severe and substantial abnormalities, which means that if even at say 26 or 27 weeks, if you discover that the fetus has a substantial abnormality, which is interpreted in a very narrow way, and we can talk about that later, then you are allowed to access an abortion, even though you come outside the 24 week limit. Um, I'll stop here. I think this does, is does that require the fetus, grave fetus abnormality, as you said, beyond the 24 week period? It requires a medical board to confirm that it is indeed the case? Yes, yes. So um, this medical board requirement, and that's something I want to touch on later, is right. uh, what was something that was earlier not part of the law officially. It sort of came up from court decisions. And then now in 2021, it's introduced as, as a codified part of the amended Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act. And one of the functions of the medical board is to, as you mentioned, um, assess whether there is a grave enough injury to the, I mean, rather grave, whether there is a substantial enough risk of handicap to the um, fetus. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you practically, how does this work, Dr. Pillay? And please allow me to read an excerpt from Legal Barriers to Accessing Safe Abortion Services in India. It was a fact-finding study that was published last year. Uh, the study found that access to abortion, as you said, is not in the will of the pregnant woman. It's a highly regulated practice whereby the law transfers the decision-making power from the pregnant woman to the registered medical practitioner, the RMP, and provides great discretion to the RMP to determine whether abortion should be provided or not. The Act recognizes that the decision to terminate a pregnancy is not just a medical one, but also implicates a range of other social, economic, familial uh, and other factors specific to the woman who's seeking abortion. Despite this recognition in the act, uh, MTP locates the power to decide whether a pregnancy should be terminated or not, uh, not with the pregnant woman, but with the medical practitioner. Um, if you could sort of elaborate on this. Yeah, um, so that is actually the, the sort of contradiction inherent in, in those two provisions working together um, is very interesting because on the one hand, it does allow um, the law, the courts, the doctors to take into account the foreseeable environment of the pregnant woman, the social factors. And in that sense, it might seem like the law is so much more liberal or progressive than comparative abortion uh, 
regulations in other countries. But on the other hand, as the excerpt very rightly points out, there is a very strong and distinct trend of medicalization, which to me is very problematic for four reasons. So I'm just going to quickly touch upon um, those four reasons. Uh, the first is the very fact that the decision making power is given to the medical professional. And this in practice has led to situations where medical professionals either reject women's requests for abortion, saying that these reasons are too frivolous or they scold them for trying to access an abortion and they try and discourage them from accessing an abortion, especially if it's their first pregnancy. So it kind of gives this amount of power to the medical professional um, through that act of transferring decision making. And this also leads to a, what in the literature has been termed the hierarchy of deservedness within the law, where certain abortions are seen and certain women are seen as more deserving of an abortion um, than the other. And the Delhi High Court's judgment is sort of speaking to that trend where um, sex sexuality within the institution of marriage is seen as more deserving of the privilege of an abortion rather than unmarried women outside the institution of marriage. So that's the first one. Um, the second is the extent of medicalization within the law. So as I said, under the 1971 Act, uh, it needed the consent of either one or two medical professionals, while under the 2021 Act, now there's a, a whole other requirement of a medical board, which usually has three to five members. And with, if we look at cases on how this uh, medical board requirement has been interpreted and used, we see there are several problems associated with that. Too quickly to mention would be one, um, the excessive delay that is caused because often right. women go to the doctor, the doctor tells them that, you know, we cannot give you an abortion. She is then forced to go to the court and the court refers her to a medical board. The medical board has to be constituted. They have to examine the woman and give its decision. And there are studies showing that this typically takes up to four weeks. And this, we must remember, is taking place within a very time sensitive environment of a pregnancy and within the within India's legislative framework where the more the pregnancy advances, the more stringent the reasons become for why preg uh, termination is allowed. And the second problem with setting up medical boards, apart from, again, giving them the power to make the decision, is that um, setting them up, especially within public sector healthcare in rural India, is really hard because they often require a gynecologist, a sonologist, a pediatrician, um, and other members. So getting this team together in a time-sensitive manner has proven to be very difficult. So, so second, the extent of medicalization and the delay that causes is definitely something for us to think about. Um, the third is the, the emphasis that is given to the role of the medical professional. So we need to remember that abortion is, of course, a medical procedure, and there has to be some kind of confer conferring between the woman and the medical professional. But mm -hmm. the problem here is the extent of the decision-making power that is given to the medical professional. So if we look at decisions from the Supreme Court and state high courts, there is almost a trend that once the medical professional has given a decision, then that becomes a deciding factor or what the courts call the sole guiding factor to decide whether termination should proceed or not. And one, so one would imagine that if a doctor told a woman that, you know, continuing with termination would be injurious to her health and recommend that she shouldn't opt for termination. She herself would decide that that's not a decision she wants to pursue. Or she might think that in light of um, sort of the harm that comes from continuation of the pregnancy, even though the medical procedure of termination might be risky, she still wants to go ahead with that procedure. And that is how decision making in other contexts happen. So if we look at the Indian Council for Medical research regulations which governs a doctor-patient relationship they very clearly provide that in other medical contexts all the doctor has to do is to provide information to the patient and her family or relatives and the decision rests with the patient the doctor cannot arbitrarily deny patient care or if the doctor says that the doctor is unable to do that particular medical procedure the doctor is under an obligation under the law to refer the patient to someone else to another medical professional so there is a kind of abortion exceptionalism with respect to the amount of weight that is given to the decision of a medic of the medical professional within the law so that's also something that's very important to highlight and my last point on this very quickly is that um, there is also a medicalization of the amount of harm, of the nature of harm rather, 
on the basis of which termination is allowed. What I mean by that is that um, under the NTPA, termination is allowed on grounds, like I mentioned, of grave injury to say mental health. Okay, so now how is mental health interpreted within the law? And there is a very distinct trend from both Supreme Court and High Court cases where simply anxiety with respect to continuation of pregnancy is not seen as grave enough injury to mental health because there is no medical reason. And these medical reasons are typically either some kind of psychological illness or an inability or like lack of mental capacity to make the decision. So there is almost a very medical understanding of when harm reaches the threshold of grave injury to mental health. And in this regard, the Supreme Court decision can be seen as taking our law forward because it issues two very important clarifications. One is that injury to mental health is different from mental illness. So mm -hmm. simply not having a mental illness does not mean that continuation of the pregnancy does not injure your mental health. Um, so that is one. And the second is the court, to me at least, seems to suggest that simply being caused or forced rather to continue an unwanted pregnancy is itself a grave injury to the mental health of the pregnant woman. It doesn't have to reach a specific threshold of say coming uh, of say the pregnancy being a result of rape or that the fetus is, you know, um, has an abnormality. Those are typically the cases where the medical and um, where the a threshold of mental injury to mental health is seen as reaching that medical threshold. So yeah. the court seems to suggest that we shouldn't be looking at it like that. But I'm hesitant to fully stand behind this sort of interpretation, not because it's wrong uh, either principally or in law, but because, like I said, there's a whole other trend of cases where medical he mental health has been interpreted in a very different way. So mm -hmm. now the Supreme Court is choosing to deviate from that trend. I think there needs to be first an acknowledgement that there is that trend, that there is a deviation in this judgment. And second, the reason for why the deviation occurs, so kind of anchoring to something, which could be the constitutional principles that the court sets out in great detail, these principles of decision autonomy, dignity, bodily integrity mean that mental health must be interpreted in this sort of liberal way, not as tied to a specific threshold. But the court doesn't do this work. So to me, it's anybody's guess as to how the next uh, judicial decision on abortion is actually going to interpret the mental health provision. But um, but the, 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 the Supreme Court decision does give you some ground to make an argument for a different kind of interpretation. So we just have to wait and see, I would say. Very interesting. That was to be my next question that, you know, these conditions that are imposed, how are they demonstrably verified? Because how do you how do you do it with, with respect to how the pre continuation of the pregnancy will affect the mental health in particular? How is that demonstrably verified? Was to be my question. Like you said, fetus abnormality is far more straightforward decision, a medical decision to be taken. A you know a doctor says this is going to happen. All this, of course, would have uh, been irrelevant had uh, we truly had reproductive autonomy, as the court claims MTP is giving us. Uh, of course, um, a couple of uh, points on the Supreme Court judgment, uh, taking forward from what you've just said. Uh, the, the court held that in determining whether the continuation of pregnancy would involve grave danger to the pregnant woman's physical or mental health, her actual or reasonably foreseeable environment uh, may be taken into account. This is already there in the MTP. Uh, the court said we are of the opinion um, that significant reliance ought to be placed on each woman's own estimation of whether she is in a position to continue and carry to term her pregnancy. Uh, additionally, the court also held that reproductive autonomy requires that every pregnant woman has the intrinsic choice uh, to choose to undergo or not to undergo uh, without any consent or authorization from a third party, husband or uh, family. Uh, now, uh, my question, uh, Dr. Pillay, to you is, uh, it's great. It's I mean, this is fantastic. I mean, we were applauding this yesterday when we, we read this part of the judgment. Uh, a, saying that you do not require consent or authorization from your husband or your family. And B, that import be placed on the home, pregnant woman's own sort of decision on whether she can indeed continue with this pregnancy or not. This is great. But what happens on the ground when, when, when I mean, will this uh, Supreme Court uh, judgment materially alter, uh, you know, the, the, and take away these hoops that women have to jump through, including getting what I, one of the studies that I refer to says enhanced consent, 
from the family before she is allowed to uh, terminate her pregnancy. Thank you, Smita. I think this actually speaks to the heart of the judgment, this question, because I think it goes, the judgment goes far beyond that immediate question of whether the MTPA includes or doesn't include unmarried women. Um, so I'll probably answer your question in two parts. The first is to talk about exactly the language that you highlighted and, and sort of what sort of value that kind of language has. And the second is your question on what all this actually means for women who are trying to approach um, and seek abortions with on the ground. Uh, so the first is about language. So like you, I shared that sort of feeling of happiness and hope and elation uh, when I read um, this part of the judgment. And I thought this is great because even, even as a lawyer, um, there are several sort of legs on which this judgment stands, um, which, which takes us further than how abortion has typically been understood. So for example, there is the decisional autonomy argument by arguing um, where the court holds that the decision to abort or not to have an abortion is very closely related to who you are as an individual and the constitution values that sort of inviolable personality of an individual and therefore we value this decision. The court also held that this decision is closely related to the woman's body, so the concept of bodily autonomy and the court, at least to me, the first time went into the kind of bodily burdens that are imposed on a woman when there is an unwanted pregnancy. So there is a very clear recognition of that. Why this is important is because pregnancy is seen as something that women so routinely do that the kind of uh, impact that a pregnancy has on our bodies isn't ever recognized within the law. So this is this, I think, is one of the first times that the law has explicitly said that it is a really big deal and we have to take it seriously that way, which I think is great. It also recognizes uh, what the court calls the cascading effects of an unwanted pregnancy. So it's not just about that one moment in the woman's life, but it has you know, really far reaching implications on her career, on her partners, on her future children, um, on her well-being, so, so really far into the future. And the last, the court talks about dignity and says that taking away this decision from women is, is sort of treating them as means to an end. And that is against the constitutional principle of dignity. And in certain places, actually, the court, to me, goes further. And I'm just going to actually read out uh, the, the two paragraphs where I think it's really important. So there's para 98 and paragraph 108, where the court almost seems to vest the sole decision making in the pregnant woman. So let me read out what the court said. So in paragraph 98, the court says the decision to have or not to have an abortion is born out of complicated life circumstances, which only the woman can choose on her own terms without external interference or influence. And kind of similarly, in paragraph 108, the court says it is the woman alone who has the right over her body. And she is the ultimate decision maker on the question of whether she wants to undergo an abortion. So there is there is a very sort of clear judicial thrust towards seeing the woman as the only, the sole, the uh, yeah, the woman alone being the decision maker. So now if we kind of contrast that to the law on abortion as it already exists, um, it makes me wonder about a couple of things. One is that if we were to take the court seriously in, in this kind of language, um, then that means that the whole MTPA is unconstitutional because the, the MTPA does not see the woman as the sole decision maker. The woman is not the only person who is involved. The doctor is very clearly involved. So if the court is actually serious about seeing the woman in this way, then it, it's not just this provision, it's not just this exclusion of unmarried women that we must be interrogating and thinking as unconstitutional, but the larger framework of abortion in the country as a whole. So it's the first point. Um, the second would be to say that, like I said, with mental health, this is one trend in interpretation. But there is a second trend in interpretation underlying abortion law, which sees the state as having certain legitimate interests in restricting women's abortion rights. So one prominent interest is the interest of the state in the fetus as a potential form of life. And this 
has actually been introduced in 2009 in the Supreme Court decision called Sujitra Srivastava, which the Supreme Court in this case also cites and approves of. So there, again, there was very strong language around autonomy and bodily integrity, but there was also the court acknowledging that the state had a compelling interest to place what the court calls reasonable restrictions on the right to abortion in light of fetal interests. So now the Supreme Court in this case strangely doesn't either refer to the Suchit Srivastava dictum or give us a reason for why now the court seems to be moving away from allowing the state to place restrictions towards a sort of absolute unrestricted right to an abortion, which is great, but it's not a decision that is in any sense reasoned and it doesn't confront squarely this other line of cases that came before it, uh, which allows the state to impose such restrictions. And so to me, the power of the court's dictum here and this really strong language that it uses, I will believe in it only once it actually comes to a point of stress testing it when there is a claim that is brought to restrict a right to abortion and the court is able to use this language of the woman being the sole decision maker to resist that claim. So while I'm optimistic, I think my optimism is sort of tinged with caution um, on this sort of specific language that the court uses. Um, and your second question was actually about whether the Supreme Court judgment actually changes anything on the ground materially, right? Yeah. And uh, so, and especially uh, the excerpt that you cite talks about how the medical practitioners still continue to impose lots of extra legal requirements and hoops, and they make the women jump through all of these hoops. And how is that all of that going to change when the court now sees the woman as a sole decision maker? So this is something that uh, I feel will not change simply by grounding the MTPA in constitutional values, simply because this, this tendency of the doctors to behave this way comes from the criminalization of abortion within our law. So imagine the criminal law as this sort of overall umbrella legislation, and which criminalizes and prohibits abortion, except in that one instance to save women from death. And then you have the MTPA, which exists very clearly as an exception to the criminal law. But you have this overall shadow of the criminal law perpetually in, um, influencing the interpretation of the MTPA. And this means several things for women. And I'm here, I'm going to quote uh, Rebecca Cook. Of course, she's not writing in the context of India, but uh, she talks about how criminalization sees criminalization of abortion, what that conveys about women. And it's very evocative, so I'm just going to quote her. She says that women seeking an abortion within a criminal law regime are labeled deviants, social pariahs, discredited persons, an underclass of potential or actual criminals, and reduced from a whole and usual person to a tainted and discounted one who is then disqualified from full social acceptance. So it has this sort of deep and profound impact on how women seeking an abortion are seen. And as a corollary, it also influences the people who provide women the abortions, that is the medical professionals. They are also seen with, so, uh, the stigma of course also affects them. And this leads to what the court, Supreme Court in this judgment has rightly pointed out as the chilling effect on the medical practitioner, which means that uh, because there is this overall shadow and overall threat of criminalization, the medical professionals always want to err on the side of caution and not um, adopt a liberal interpretation of the NTPA. So as the mental health provision that I discussed earlier, you can either see it as allowing abortions only when there is a threat of a disease, like a mental health, mental illness, which is a very stringent interpretation. Or you can see it as the Supreme Court suggests that any unwanted pregnancy is a threat to mental health. These are sort of on two ends of the spectrum. And because there is the shadow of criminalization and the medical professionals don't want to get embroiled in uh, you know, being taken to court, prosecuted for um, uh, breaching the criminal law of the country, they tend to adopt the more conservative interpretation. And criminalization, do you have sorry, a question? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just, I, just to, uh, so, I, so I don't forget, and just to clarify yeah. what you're saying, I, I remember a conversation I had with Dr. Arvind Datar years ago, and mm -hmm. he's been part of this medical. I remember him telling me when I asked him a similar question on why this sort of 
uh, can't criminalization be sort of done away with, you know, that sort of makes things much simpler. So I remember him telling me that primarily he believes that the driver behind this, uh, behind this, keeping this in the statute books is the fact that India has such a, uh, has had such a high uh, number of sex selective abortions and therefore the criminalization uh, sort of provision needs to revert. That seems to be the, 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 the sort of argument. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that is certainly one of the arguments that come up from sort of uh, either response by the state as to why the uh, provision, either criminalization or why restrictions and abortions are introduced. A common response is that there is a very high trend of sex selection, sex selective abortions. So one thing is to recognize that we already have a statute in India, uh, which targets, which makes sex selects. Um, sorry, sex determination a crime, uh, which is the PCP NDT, which the judgment also mentions, Supreme Court judgment. So ideally, if that legislation is uh, effective and is implemented successfully, sex selective abortions will not happen because sex determination itself is made criminal. I am, I mean, I don't entirely support that legislation also because, and this sort of distinction that I drew earlier between sex determination and abortion, because I think that the two really feed into one another. Um, and just as an example, uh, there is a very strong trend of not of doctors refusing uh, to co uh, conduct abortions in the second trimester because it is automatically assumed that they are sex selective in nature, even though the conditions under the MTPA are already satisfied. And, um, and similarly, there is uh, also a trend which is recorded within the empirical literature that um, doctors conduct a lot I mean, sort of uh, providing abortions in the second trimester are targeted by the state and subject to a lot of you know bookkeeping requirements and things like that um, so there's sort of penalization uh, which comes from the criminal prohibition both on abortion and sex determination so i actually think eventually both of them work together in this um really powerful nexus to restrict a legislation which otherwise has potential to be interpreted in a broad and liberal uh, way, which is um, the MTPA. Uh, so yeah, so so to answer your question on whether um, the Supreme Court's language and its recent decision actually alters things in the ground, I think that a big factor which influences how abortion decision making happens in the ground is this criminal prohibition. And unless India moves away from that criminal prohibition, uh, it, it's very hard to see how simply recognizing abortion as a right is really going to change anything between in that within that sort of MTPA IPC nexus that exists in India. Uh, you're on mute, huh? Smita. You're you're on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have wanted to ask you. Apologize. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, about, about, about something that you referred to. Uh, you know about the court sort of looking at uh, fe fetal rights or whatever. That, that, and let, let me let me come to that in just a bit. I quickly want to touch upon what the Supreme Court said uh, on the fact that uh, rape includes marital rape for the purposes of medical termination of pregnancy act and rules and. Uh, the women who conceive out of uh, forced sex by their husbands will also come within the ambit of the survivors of sexual assault or rape or incest mentioned in Rule 3B uh, of the 2003 rules amended in 2021, uh, allowing them to seek termination of pregnancy in this 20 to 24 week uh, period. Can you, Dr. Pillay, talk to the significance of this? Um, yes, of course. Uh, so the significance of this holding by the Supreme Court comes in light of what is called the marital rape exception within our criminal law. So this is section 375 of the same Indian Penal Code, which criminalizes rape, but it exempts rape between, uh, I mean, it exempts rape by the husband of the wife within the institution of marriage um, and from the definition of rape. So rape, marital rape is not rape in India under India's criminal prohibition on rape. And recently uh, there was a Delhi High Court decision because on the constitutionality of this exemption, like, is this against women's equality? Is this against women's privacy and autonomy? All of these values that the Supreme Court today, yesterday has, you know, um, given a sort of elevated constitutional status. 
Um, and the Delhi High Court actually rendered a split verdict where it was a two judge bench. And there was one judge who said that this is against pretty much our entire constitutional scheme and held that the exception is unconstitutional. And there was the other judge who said that um, there is an, what he called an intelligible differentia between stranger rape and rape by your husband. And uh, this is essentially came from um, understand from the understanding that marriage means that you've consented to sexual intercourse with your husband throughout and then there is no repeated need to seek uh, consent. It also comes from constitutional law. Traditionally, it's reluctance to enter into private spaces like the home because it, con the, the duty of the state is seen as not interfering in the life of the citizens. So now requiring the state to interfere or, or to come into the home and sort of uh, deal with an issue of rape by the husband and the wife is seen as going beyond constitutional or traditional role and ambit. And there's a very, uh, there's this metaphor that would be like introducing a bull into a China shop, because then it would do so much harm, um, allowing the state into the home, into the privacy of the home, that kind of a thing. So that, that was the, uh, the other judge when he said that it is not unconstitutional, that was a sort of philosophical and constitutional leanings that he was drawing on to make his argument. Um, so now this case is, there is an appeal from the Delhi High Court decision. I mean, it's before the Supreme Court now to decide the constitutionality of the marital rape. Yes. Yeah, separately, nothing to do with this case. But here, the Supreme Court is saying that, uh, is recognizing rather that rape, of course, happens in the context of marriage. And uh, marriage does not mean that you have consented to sexual intercourse throughout with your husband. And the reality of how gender-based violence happens is that it often happens within these sort of intimate partner spaces, whether it is within or outside the institution of marriage. So within this recognition, the court has definitely... Um, sort of struck back at what the judge of the Delhi High Court held um, about, you know, what I said about constitutional laws reluctance to come into the home. There is a recognition that the home can be a very unequal and unfair space and that state duties are not just to keep away from the home and kind of preserve its sanctity, but also to redress inequalities and imbalances and power within institutions like the home or marriage. So that's, I think it's a very positive step, but then the court, of course, qualified it as it should and said that this is only applicable to abortion the other issue about the overall constitutionality of the marital rape exception is still under consideration and the court did not comment on it um just on that though i was just wondering what does this sort of suggest or is this something that we can be hopeful about and i think i would be optimistic i think the court is kind of gesturing at a decision that might come hopefully on the marital rape exception and it sort of reminds me of what happened in 2017 with respect to the decriminalization of homosexuality in the state of her there was the earlier decision of Swami, which recognized again this right to privacy and mm -hmm. Autonomy. And Justice Chandra showed again in that decision um, did remark that if we are to take uh, decision autonomy seriously, then Section 377, which criminalizes um, same sex relationships and sexual intercourse in that context, would be uh, uh, unconstitutional. But the court didn't really go into that because it was already pending before the court. And a month or two later, I think, um, the Supreme Court struck down Section 377 as unconstitutional. So hopefully we can maybe see this indication in this decision as a gesture to something that may be coming. Um, but yeah, again, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see where the court sort of goes with that. Okay. A couple of final questions, Dr. Pillay. Uh, one, that it was my understanding, till I read your blog post on, uh, guest blog post on Gautam Bhatia's blog, uh, it was my understanding that uh, uh, lawmakers and judicial decisions on concerning abortion, lawmaking and judici judicial decisions concerning abortion in India had steer cleared of what I so thought was a peculiarly American obsession with fetal rights. Uh, but I got to understand from your blog post that recently there have been references to, to fetal rights in uh, certain judicial decisions, one of them being the Delhi High Court uh, decision turning down permission for this particular woman um, uh, in, in, in July when it happened. So could you get our viewer, tell our viewers what this is and how do you, what, where is this influence coming from? 
Yeah, that, that's a really great question. Um, and it's something that I devote a lot of my um, energy and attention to in my PhD thesis. Um, so yeah, so you're very right that that particular blog post was about the Delhi High Court decision. And the Delhi High Court decision said two things to me. The first is that it said that unmarried women cannot come within the ambit of the specific uh, Rule 3B that is under challenge in this case also. And, it, it, and a less sort of obvious argument, but which still strongly existed, was that we cannot allow later term uh, terminations, because this was a termination at 23 weeks, I think. So we cannot allow later term terminations because uh, that would, what the court called virtually, that would be virtually like killing a child. So there is then a definite invocation of the fetus as a child and the abortion as a form of murder or killing of the child, right? So this, to me, speaks to a growing trend. That's what I call it in my article, a growing trend of fetal interest um, in Indian abortion law. And let me give you another really recent example to, to kind of add to that trend. So there was a 2020 decision uh, by the Kerala High Court where the petitioners there were a very um, uh, strategically called cry for life society. And uh, they filed a, decision, uh, filed a petition in the Kerala High Court arguing that the MTPA is unconstitutional because it violates the right to life of the fetus. They said that fetus, fetal life accrues from the point of conception, uh, which is actually not even the position of law in the US, as, as you mentioned. But so it starts from the point of conception. The fetus is this, and they use the language of fetus is innocent, it is vulnerable. And then, you know, the doctors and women are now taking away the life of this innocent being through termination of pregnancy and the kerala high court um I mean, in, in terms of outcome, its decision is encouraging because it held that the MTPA is constitutional and it simply held that it doesn't violate the right to life because the purpose of the MTPA is to promote women's right to life. So, uh, but the problem with the Kerala High Court decision, which I actually recently wrote about in a case note uh, for the National Law School Journal, um, is that it completely evades the question of fetal right to life, which is what the petitioners brought before the court. And this is a continuous trend. I mean, this a very similar argument was made, made back in 2005 before the Rajasthan High Court. And even then, the court simply evaded the question of fetal interest, um, of fetal life. And talked about the women's right to life. Now, on the appeal from the Delhi High Court to the Supreme Court, in its ad interim order, the Supreme Court also did not talk about the question of fetal life, even though that was something that the Delhi High Court mentioned in its judgment, right? So, and then now we have an appeal from that Kerala High Court decision, Cry for Life Society has now appealed to the Supreme Court from the Kerala High Court decision, uh, once again, bringing up these um, claims of fetal interest. So there is all of this to say that there is, a, a, I think, a very strong growing trend of fetal interest. And to answer your question on where is this even coming from, I think that's very important to ask because you're very right. Like In the drafting of the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act back in 1971, there was really not much of a talk of fetal interests or how fetal right to life must uh, figure into our legal regulation on abortion. Uh, there were, of course, a couple of people uh, in the parliament who brought up the question of fetal right to life, but uh, that was sort of pushed aside saying that this does not apply to India or there is no violation of right to life and therefore the statute will continue. To me, this is not really an affirmation of women's rights as much as it is um, motivated by the sort of politic, socio-political context in which abortion became liberalized in India, which is to do with um, population. I mean, a, a lot of scholars argue that the liberalization of abortion is closely tied to India's sort of quest to reduce its population. And yeah, so this population control ideology means that they saw abortion as a method of population control along with contraception. And therefore, there was a, a thrust to increase access to abortions. Of course, the state denied this, but uh, this is what um, uh, even some members in the parliament spoke to this uh, understanding of abortion as a method of population control. Anyway, so there is no, uh, I'll just quickly it, it say one more thing. Um, so there is no, within the drafting history, there is no real um, mention of fetal interest. So where it comes from, to me, it comes from a very 
questionable transplantation of comparative law because in the 2009 Sujitra Srivastava decision that I mentioned, it was a really landmark case because it was for the first time recognizing reproductive rights as a matter of constitutional law. And in Sujitra Srivastava, the court cited Roe v. Wade from the US Supreme Court and explicitly quoted uh, like took language from Roe v. Wade to say that the state has a compelling interest in uh, promoting fetal potentiality. So to me, there was a, a transplantation of Roe v. Wade from the US to India without really understanding whether it suits India's social and political context because fetal interest is not a prominent narrative in India and has never been. So, and since Uchitra Srivastava, this uh, language has become more and more prominent and in the uh, cry for life society case before the supreme court the petitioners invoke Suchitra Srivastava and they kind of use it as their constitutional hook to argue that fetal interests are now a part of our abortion regulation so we really need to think about the importance that we give I mean now the importance that we give to the U.S. decisions and uh, which are anyway questionable now and yeah how that has sort of led to uh, this outsider to Indian abortion law, fetal interest now just coming into its regulation. You're still on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have so many follow-ups to that, but we're sort of running out of time. Um, I'll try and link to the pieces that you've written so our viewers who are interested in knowing more perhaps could 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 read it. Uh, a final question though, Dr. Pillay, and it's a tough one, uh, which is that what is the headline for you from if you had to write a headline? from yesterday's uh, decision of the Supreme Court and how it affects the framework of reproductive rights in India, um, what would your headline be? That is a tough one. Um, I think I would say cautious optimism. That's what I'm going to go with. I think that there is definite room for some of the principles that the court has given us to be used in a very productive way by litigators down the road and by academics like me working on abortion rights down the road. But like I said, there, there is um, the, the shifts that the court has taken or the leaps that it has taken have, have not really been um, seen as shifts or leaps, you know, it is sort of there's no identification or acknowledgement by the court that there are certain steps that are being taken and we are moving in this direction for a specific reason. And that to me takes away from the power of those shifts because now the next decision that comes up before another court on abortion, th there is no real anchor to why the court must follow this trend over the other trend, which also exists within Indian abortion law. So what I would like to see I'm optimistic, but it's cautious because I want to see how this plays out. And what I would like to see is for later decisions to give us reasons as to why why some interpretations of the law must be preferred over the others. And this Supreme Court decision maybe gives us the framework to do that kind of reasoning because it talks about constitutional values and using those values to interpret the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act in a specific way. So maybe we can anchor all of these progressive interpretations within the constitution and sort of use that as our basis to um, argue for one trend over the other. But all of this is work that remains to be done. So, um, yeah, let's wait. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Dr. Gauri Pillay, thank you so much for your time, uh, for your insight, and, and really for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for the great conversation.